Good morning. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you for the gift of this day and for each other. For this opportunity to worship you together in spirit and in truth. We pray as always that you might remind us once again of your great, unconditional and eternal love for us and for all humankind. Feed us with your word, feed us with your supper. We thank you for everything, Lord. Then we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> My sermon text this morning is the first lesson assigned for today, namely 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 4 through 8 is a short, a brief text. <clears throat> My sermon title for today is You Won't Believe What's Next. You Won't Believe What's Next. <laughs> The biblical books of 1st and 2nd Kings were originally just one book, namely the book of Kings. The same goes, by the way, for its counterparts, 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Chronicles. The author of Kings is unknown, as is its date of composition. It is a part of a corpus or a body of biblical works that goes by a couple of different names or designations. The books Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings are often referred to as the former prophets concerning a group of early non-writing prophets in Israel's history. That is, as opposed to the latter prophets who come later in time and often write their own books which bear their names, such as Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. <clears throat> this same corpus or body is often also called the Deuteronomistic History, since it describes a lengthy period during Israel's history, namely from 1200 to 600 B.C., which is viewed through the lens of the preceding book of Deuteronomy, where God lays out a vision and commands for his people's future in the promised land of Israel as they enter it. Although the various authors of all these works are unknown, scholars do posit the hand of an overall editor, to this history, thus giving it a certain unity of thought, whom some speculate to be one Baruch, the scribe of the prophet Jeremiah. More specifically speaking, the first ten chapters of this book of 1 Kings concern the reign of the United Kingdom's last monarch, King Solomon, before the nation divides in two with Israel or Ephraim in the north, Judah in the south, each with its own king. Chapter 11, through the end of the book, concerns the history of Israel in the north. Even more specifically, we find ourselves this morning in 1 Kings chapter 19, in the middle of a cycle of stories concerning that famous prophet Elijah, who prophesied in the northern kingdom of Israel sometime around 850 B.C., or before Christ, during the reigns of two notorious kings, Ahab and Ahaziah. Ahab's wife, Jezebel, was herself no stranger. To notoriety. The stories of Elijah commence in chapter 17, where he is innocently introduced as Elijah the Tishbite, hailing from the obscure locale of Tishba in Gilead, and immediately confronts King Ahab with a three year drought on the land, which he will bring about by his prophetic word. Elijah's colorful life will not conclude until 2 Kings chapter 3, when he is memorably whisked away alive into heaven by a whirlwind and a chariot and horses of fire. In between those two bookends, as it were, lie a succession of miracles which Elijah beholds, experiences, and even participates in. First comes his being fed by ravens while hiding out at the Cherith River. Then comes his miraculous provision for the widow of Zarephath, who only had a little meal and oil left in her life, which Elijah calls to last many days and months. Next, that widow's son dies, and Elijah raises him from the dead by stretching himself out upon the corpse three times. Finally, there is the climactic and most popular story of all, namely the contest, more like a showdown, on top of Mount Carmel between himself and the 450 false prophets of Baal. Baal was a pagan god who rivaled Yahweh for the Israelites' affection. 
Yahweh and his prophet Elijah win this contest as Yahweh pours out fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice Elijah has just laid out, a feat Baal is not able to duplicate, and so the 450 false prophets are then slaughtered in the aftermath. Hearing this news, Queen Jezebel, who is a patron of Baal herself, threatens to kill Elijah. The immediately preceding verse to today's text states, Then Elijah was afraid. He got up and fled for his life. He comes to Beersheba in the far south of Judah and leaves his only servant there. He is alone. And that's where today's text finds us. And so the first thing that leaps out at me about the story before us this morning and the larger surrounding narrative is the fact that Elijah seems always to be on the run because he prophesies a threatening word of judgment by drought to the king. He is forced to flee alone to the brook Cherith where birds have to feed him. Because he is not safe in Israel, he is forced to flee to Zarephath in Sidon where he encounters the aforementioned widow and her son. He returns to Israel, issues the challenge on top of Mount Carmel, wins it, and rapidly flees again for his life out of fear. If you are a child of God, a man or woman of God, who has seen many mighty miracles and indeed performed some yourself, why should you always have to be on the run? Why should you always have to be fleeing for your life in fear? I mean, if I had publicly won a contest on top of a mountain with 450 false prophets of a false god, especially by means of a consuming fire issuing forth from heaven, I think I might respond to Ahab and Jezebel's threats on my life by saying, oh yeah, come and get me. Bring it on. But Elijah runs out of fear. What do you do, my friends? When you've seen God come through time and again in your life, and yet you are still on the run. What do you do when God has repeatedly delivered you, and yet you still live the life on some level of a fugitive? What do you do when your call is to bring faithfulness and yet confront idolatry? To bring sustenance and yet confront injustice? To encourage faithfulness and fidelity and yet oppose kings and queens. To proclaim, thus saith the Lord, at every opportunity and yet face death at every turn. What if you're doing the right thing means facing off against others who are hell-bent on doing the wrong thing? What if running for Jesus means actually running for your very life? What if taking a stand? at home, at school, on your job, among your friends, means taking a fall. Who wants to be a prophet if you've got to be fed by birds? Who wants to be used as a vessel of God if your presence is always deemed, as Elijah's was earlier, as troubling? Who wants to be anointed of God if you bring drought and death with you at the same time you bring sustenance and new life? So even when you win battles, you feel like you've lost them. Even on the triumphant heights of victory, you plummet quickly into the depths of despair. Even on the heels of unimaginable feats of accomplishment, you drop like a rag doll into the abyss of fear, anxiety, depression, and exhaustion. Why does the reward for faithfulness so often seem to be loneliness. The consequence of obedience, fatigue. The result of loyal perseverance, fear and burnout. And so you leave your only friend and companion there at Beersheba, the last stop in civilization, and you head out into the wilderness yourself and you ask to die. Elijah went a day's journey into the wilderness, verse 4 records, and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. Could a lonelier picture be painted, my friends? One single solitary man under one single solitary 
broom tree out in the middle of nowhere. He asked that he might die. It is enough. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life. Surely this man deserves a better ending than this. The mighty Elijah, immortalized not only in holy writ, but also in subsequent secular literature, majestic music and breathtaking art, fleeing in fear, utterly alone, saying, God, I'm tired and I've had enough. Lord, I've had enough. Can I simply fall asleep tonight and not wake up tomorrow morning? If you live long enough, my friends, if you experience enough heartache and heartbreak, if you fight enough battles and trudge through enough suffering, you too will express this plaintive cry of exasperation and resignation. And you'd be in good biblical company. Moses, too, asked that he might die if current circumstances continued back in Numbers 11. Jeremiah wished that he had died in utero in his mother's womb in the 20th chapter of his book. Jonah was so angry that he asked God that he might die three different times in the final chapter of his book alone. Job assessed life and preferred death in chapter 2 of his book. And the Apostle Paul himself wrestled between the two in Philippians chapter 1 by openly stating, I would rather depart this life and go to be with Christ because that would be far better. So we should not be too embarrassed for secretly harboring such sentiments in our own hearts. Life is hard. It is at times difficult beyond words. We can become depleted and bone weary no matter how many miracles we have witnessed or participated in. None of us is exempt from our own solitary broom tree experience the remedy quote unquote in this text is so simple as to be almost laughable sleep and eat rest and sustenance Elijah falls asleep for the first time in verse 5 we're not sure how much time elapses before an angel rouses him and instructs him to get up and eat and just as before, at the brook Cherith, there is food and drink supplied. He eats and he drinks. And then guess what? He falls asleep again for the second time. In verse 7, the angel rouses him a second time, again after an undetermined length of time, with identical directions to get up and eat. And again for the second time, Elijah does just that gets up and he eats the angel adds something in verse 7 though that he omitted in verse 5 get up and eat he exhorts Elijah otherwise the journey will be too much for you hold up now what journey I didn't ask for another journey and I certainly don't want one didn't you hear me earlier I said it's enough now please just let me expire and go to heaven quietly. Why are you talking about a journey? The last thing I want is another journey. I just told you I want to die. Regardless of his personal wishes, desires, or resignation, there is apparently more to come. Look at your neighbor, please, and say, there's more to come. Just when you thought I've graduated and now it's enough. I've been married and have had kids. It's enough. My kids are grown and now I'm an empty nester. It's enough. I've done all I can at my job. I have peaked. I have maxed out. I've even retired. It's enough. My productive days of bearing fruit are over. Long in the rearview mirror. 
and now I'm just hanging around. It's enough. No, God now says rest and eat because another journey is ahead of you. Hmm. There's more to come indeed. In verse 8, Elijah goes in the strength of that food, which he has just received, 40 days and 40 nights. A biblically significant number suggesting a long period of time, a certain set season. To Horeb, the mount of God. An alternative name for Mount Sinai, where God had appeared earlier to Moses and the people, giving them the Ten Commandments and the law. Subsequently, outside of our assigned text for today, Elijah will be granted an audience with God there. A direct divine encounter. Not in wind, fire, or earthquake, but rather in a still, small voice. Where an open, honest conversation occurs, Elijah gets to vent, as it were. God reminds him that although he may feel alone, he is not alone, and then commissions Elijah with a couple further tasks. Isn't it interesting, my friends, that this bone-weary, depleted prophet that we encounter this morning has had enough of life, and yet there's more to come. He has fulfilled his duty, and yet... There's more to come. He sees that he's at the end of his rope and yet has that rope lengthened. And not just that, but that further journey yet to come involves apparently meeting and encountering God for the very first time. Yes, he's been prophesying for a long time now. Yes, he's been doing ministry for a long time now. Yes, he's been active in proclaiming God's word and performing God's deeds for a long time now. But in each and every instance prior to this point in the narrative, Scripture simply records that the word of the Lord came to Elijah and said dot, 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 dot. There is a sense then that he has been enlisted, compelled, and commissioned from on high but there is no direct encounter with the holy. No immediate audience with the transcendent. No personal face-to-face -face with the one in whose name and by whose power Elijah has been active, lo, these many years. He's been faithfully serving, in other words. But he has yet not quite dwelt in the presence of wind, fire, and earthquake followed by a still, small voice. He's been too busy, too active, running here and there, doing this and that, to have the opportunity to wrap his face in his mantle and to go out and stand at the entrance to that holy cave on this holy mountain as God, God's self, prepares to pass by. Yes, he has heard from God by way of instruction to go and do this or that, but he's yet to hear from God, how are you doing, Elijah? How are you feeling? How are you holding up? What's wrong? He may have been receiving, commanding, and guiding words from on high, but he has yet to receive a word of love, concern, and consolation, and a voice right beside him. He has been part of or performed miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle so as to render him both legendary amongst God's people and servants and one of only two people to be taken alive into heaven without having to die, without ever being the recipient of a visit from the one who created, called, and commissioned him from before the foundation of the world itself. My friends, what if your remaining journey involves such an encounter with God? What if you have been a dutiful and faithful servant a la Martha in the New Testament and now you are invited to a more personal intimacy with God a la Mary? What if after running around Israel and Sidon and Zarephath and Mount Carmel, you are now being beckoned up your own Mount Sinai? What if you've had your fill and share of wind, fire, and earthquake, and now the newer journey is further into that still, small voice? What if instead of do this and do that, the voice of the Lord now says, How are you? How are you doing? 
How are you holding up? Like Elijah, there is more to your journey. There is more to come. Like Elijah, you are still following and heeding the same being with the same voice. And like Elijah, it's just that now the journey will be much more profound than you ever could have imagined. Now you get to encounter God in a deeper, perhaps truer, certainly more immediate fashion. And in your weariness of doing, you now experience the consolation of being. Being bathed in the eternal presence of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. After being replenished from his exhaustion by sleep and by food. Verse 8 says that Elijah went in the strength of that food. Forty days and forty nights to his destination to Horeb to God. His journey was furthered and made possible in the strength of that food. Hope was restored in the strength of that food. Passion was rekindled in the strength of that food. And I believe joy, joy was rediscovered in the strength of that food. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the bread of life and the living waters. And He comes to us in the scriptural Word of God in the sacrament of Holy Communion with His very body and blood for the forgiveness of our sin and in the fellowship of this body of saints, this worshiping community. And so we go, you and I go, in the strength of that food on the remainder of our journey. We hear in the strength of that food the calling to embark yet again on the road God has for us. Can you hear the angel's voice, my friends? Can you feel the angels nudging you in the side saying, get up, get up and eat. Get up and eat or otherwise the journey will be too difficult for you. And can you hear the still small voice beckoning you to continue saying there's more yet to come. Saying the time has come for a personal audience, a personal encounter saying, wrap your face in a mantle, stand at the opening of your cave, for I am about to pass by, and I, God, want you to be there. You won't believe what's next. 